living longer, living healthier, living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. Numbering 52 million, people living with disabilities are the largest minority in America, accounting for 19% of the country's population. Chances are you are related to someone, have a friend, or know someone living with a disability. Perhaps you live with a disability yourself. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life, a show dedicated to helping you do just that. I'm Beth Brown, your host. Today we talk about advocating for the rights of people with disabilities. Stay tuned. We're joined now by Cassandra Rawson, who is here to talk about her experiences living with a disability. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having so me. So can you start out by just telling us um, about your disability and how it happened? You weren't born with this, right? No, I wasn't born with my disability. I was 17 years old, a senior in high school, and I was out riding four-wheelers with a couple of friends. I was not very experienced on the four-wheeler, and I went up a hill. I realized I was taking the wrong turn. I hit the gas instead of the brake and went off about a 12-foot drop-off. When I landed, I don't know if the four-wheeler landed on my stomach or if I just landed oddly, but I, when I looked down, I, my legs were at a really awkward angle and I couldn't feel my legs and I knew immediately that I was paralyzed. So I went from St. Peter's Hospital, they life flighted me to Harborview in Seattle, okay. um, where they destabilized my spine. And then I went to University of Washington, which has an amazing program for outpatient therapy or inpatient therapy, where I learned to do all the things that I did before, like cooking, cleaning, driving, uh, interacting with people. But now I did it from a sitting position. So. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit, because you have definitely not let yourself slow down at all, even <laughs> though you're in a wheelchair. What are some of the challenges that you've maybe had to overcome being in a wheelchair? Oh, geez, some of the biggest challenges really are finding accessible bathrooms, finding accessible buildings, and parking. Um, everyone knows that you're not supposed to park in the handicapped spots unless sure. you have a placard, right? right? But a lot of people don't know that you're also not supposed to park in those lines next to the spots. Those are used for lifts, for uh, wheelchairs from the vans. They're also used for people like me who needs to get next to their car, take their wheelchair apart, put it in their car. So there's been a lot of times that motorcycles like to park in those little mm -hmm. those little lines, and I would I would ask that they not do that. Yeah. Um, bathrooms are another huge one. I fly a lot, and I'm the first person on a plane, and I'm the last person off a plane. So when I have when it says that you have a one hour layover, my layover is actually about 30 minutes, and trying to find a bathroom, you can go in, and you know how airports are. There's dozens of bathrooms in there. And the only one that's ever taken is the big one. Oh, yeah. And people, they, I'm not sure if they just don't realize it. They just like the bigger bathroom. So I, I would ask that people not use those if they have a choice. Mm -hmm. so, so those are some of the, the struggles. But Okay. Okay. And just when it comes to interacting with folks, what do you wish that people knew about people with disabilities? You know, a disability can happen to anyone at any time. You could be driving home and you get into a car accident, or your spouse falls off a ladder, or your child gets an infection, and in the blink of an eye, your life has changed. And so I would like people to really think about what's around them. Again, noticing little things about, maybe I shouldn't park here, um, or hold the door open. If you see me coming, I will never complain if someone opens <laughs> the door for me, I love it. Um, so that's what I like. We're, we're really just like everyone else. I just do things from a sitting position instead of a standing position. Okay. So you talked about holding the door open for mm -hmm. you, things like that. Is there any other advice you would give to the general public when it comes to kind of looking out for or taking care of somebody who has a disability? You know, I don't know about taking care of. There's a lot of things that goes into caretaking that would be different, but I know for me, part of Part of being in a wheelchair is that you're at a lower level. And so when you are in a large group of people, everyone is standing above you. 
and pretty soon you feel very claustrophobic and your neck starts to hurt. And so I appreciate it when I'm talking to somebody and they sit down so I can look at them face to face. Um, that's just something simple that anyone can do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I know that you've also advocated for yourself and for people with disabilities. Can you talk a little bit about some of the advocacy you've done? You know, I do little things. I, I love working with kids. That's what I focused on in my degree in college. And kids are wonderful. They're very, very curious and they want to ask a lot of questions and I never have a problem answering questions. For example, if I'm in a supermarket and I see a little kid kind of staring at me, I'll say, you know, do you have a question? And they'll either ask it or they'll shy away. Sure. But unfortunately, it's usually the parents that pull the kid away and say, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry they bothered you. And they tell the kid, don't, don't stare, don't ask questions. And I wish they wouldn't do that. I wish that they said, if you, you want to ask her a question, please do. Because usually the, the kid will come up and say, why do you have to use that? And I'll tell them, well, I broke my back. My legs don't work anymore. And they go, oh, OK. And they <laughs> run off. And it's, they just want their curiosity satisfied. Mm -hmm. And I think adults have that same thing, but they've been conditioned to not ask questions. And yeah. I can only speak for myself, but I have no problem answering questions. So okay. um, one of the things I did, I worked in college. One of my internships was with Head Start. And the kids there were hilarious. They had question and answer time. They wanted to know, how do you drive? And how do you do this? And so I would show them how I took my chair apart, how I got into the car, all this stuff. And then one of them asked me, well, how do you sleep? So I made a little bed on their their lunch table laid down <laughs> and they said oh okay well i found out weeks later from one of the parent teacher conferences that they literally thought that i had to sleep on their kitchen table or their lunch table oh, at no. night <laughs> so i that took a little more explaining kids are very literal and i forgot that so I, I like to do little things to make people make people more comfortable. Perfect. So we only have a couple seconds left, but just really quickly, for those folks who have a disability and don't know how to advocate for themselves, one piece of advice you'd give? I would say put on your best smile because you're going to get the attitude returned to you that you're portraying to others. That's perfect. Thank you, Cassandra, so you're much welcome. for being here. Thank you. We need to pause here for a short break, but coming up next, much has been done to fight for the rights of people living with disabilities. We're going to learn all about that right after this. Don't go away. Welcome back. Joining us now is Roberta Zanker, an attorney with Disability Rights Montana. So thanks so much for being with us. Let's talk a little bit first about your organization and what Disability Rights Montana does. Disability Rights Montana has been around actually for a long time, about 40 years. And we are a protection and advocacy agency and there's actually a system of, we call them PNAs, across the country that began in the 1970s as a um, reaction to uh, conditions that, that people with disabilities experience. They were sort of ignored and left in. Um, different institutions and uh, many uh, many people living in inhumane conditions. So mm -hmm. there was a kind of a great hue and outcry to, to do something and Congress came up with a system of protection and advocacy agencies. So um, Disability Rights Montana is Montana's PNA and um, today we provide a whole array of services uh, for people who experience disabilities. Um, uh, information and referral, short-term short assistance, sometimes litigation, help with housing, uh, employment, transportation, just a whole array of issues. Yeah, that's awesome. And so you talked about being an advocacy agency. So what do you actually try to teach people about disabilities and what it means to be disabled? Well, it's, um, it's very important to understand that people with disabilities or who experience disabilities uh, are entitled to the same opportunities, um, benefits and services, and are able to experience those as anyone else. And so um, integration uh, into the community and into society and inclusion are sort of the most important things that we um, 
that, that we want to emphasize is to bring people in to remove ac um, barriers to access and, and to get people involved, that people can hold jobs, they can um, be part of, of all of the goings on in communities and in society, and we want to get people involved. Great. And so you focus more on people's abilities rather than disabilities, right? Can you exactly. talk a little bit about um, how you keep that focus? You know, language is, is critical, it's central, and, and people, uh, within the disability community emphasize something they call people first language. Mm -hmm. And that's a, just a great way to remember, remember it. It's just people first. How do I emphasize the person rather than a disability that that person may or may not experience? So um, that's what we would say is people first language and focus on the person, not the disability. Um, people who experience disability, it's just a trait. It's just you know something that's part of them. It is not the person. It is mm -hmm. not who they are. So we might say something like you've heard me say already: a person who experiences a disability, rather than that person is disabled, because mm -hmm. that's not who they are. Perfect. So let's talk a little bit about um, etiquette. So we heard from Cassandra in the first segment. She talked about, you know, just coming down to her level since she's in a wheelchair. Do you have other tips like that for folks who are interacting with people with disabilities, how to act around them and proper etiquette? Well, I think the first thing is that people who experience disability uh, are generally looking for inclusion. They're not looking for sympathy. Mm -hmm. So they're not looking to be set apart or pampered or um, you know, giving, given special um, treatment. So if you want to help, that's fine. And sometimes uh, people who experience disabilities do need help, but we should ask. We should just say, hey, can I give you a hand? And uh, once we do that, then we don't, and if the person says yes, we don't assume what help is needed. We have to then go and ask, okay. you know, well, how can I help? What can I help you with? And, and then just kind of do that, not take over, not take control. You know, we don't look down at people. Uh, we treat adults as adults and children as children. Right. Um, you know, one of, you know, one of the stereotypes is that when we encounter somebody who experiences a disability, we speak up right. <laughs> like it's a hearing <laughs> problem and, and it's not. Okay. So, you know, we don't have to do that. We just have to be ourselves Perfect. and allow that person to be themselves and try to engage with the person, not the disability. Perfect. Can you talk about some of the laws that protect folks who experience a disability? There are actually a whole host of laws, and when I do presentations in this area, I actually hand out a page and a half of disability laws. But some of the principal ones um, would be the uh, Air Carriers Access Act. Uh, we're certainly familiar generally with the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's also the Fair Housing Act, which deals with rental housing and that sort of thing. And in education, the Individuals uh, with Disabilities Education Act Act and the 501 um, uh, education laws as well, um, Rehabilitation Act. So all of those laws work together um, to provide for access and benefits and services for people who experience disabilities. And you mentioned the big one there, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Um, we're just about out of time, so this is a tough one, but can you just give us a couple things about what that act does for folks? The ADA levels the playing field. Uh, it provides for access and opportunities to benefits and services in um, public accommodations, government services, uh, employment, housing, uh, education, transportation. It's a very wide and broad, all-encompassing law. We're certainly familiar with um, what we call the, um, the ADA guidelines, which deal with parking spaces and restrooms and curb cuts and all of those things. Okay. Okay, perfect. So we need to pause here for just a quick break. But coming up next, we'll talk more with Roberta from Disability Rights Montana about additional requirements in the ADA to benefit those people who experience disabilities. We'll be right back after this. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We're still talking with Roberta Zanker of Disability Rights Montana about the Americans with Disabilities Act and how it protects people experiencing disabilities. So thanks for sticking around with us. So the ADA, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, that went into effect in 1990. So yes. what about those buildings that were built before then? How do they get up to the requirements laid out by the ADA? Well, the ADA had a, a grandfather clause so that if a building was in, in existence at the time, the ADA went into um, um, implementation, then, then that building did not have to rebuild, you know, the owners didn't have to rebuild it, so, and that was fine. But if they remodel or retrofit or have any alterations to their building, then the ADA guidelines um, would apply to that rebuild. Okay, so if a person has to try to get into a building and has a disability and just can't get in, what are those, what, it, what options does that person have? What can they do? Well, there, there are two things we would encourage them to do. One is to call us at Disability Rights Montana or okay. visit our website and, and make a complaint to us um, so that we can go and survey um, that building and contact that uh, proprietor or owner and talk to them about their accessibility and try to get them up to code and try to work with them to do that. Uh, or they can make their complaint formally to the Montana Human Rights Bureau. Okay, so um, the ADA applies to more than just buildings. So let's talk about some of the other, um, I guess, experiences that people might have being around town that the ADA also helps. Well, as I said before, the ADA applies it's created to provide um, opportunities and to uh, provide for equal access to an inclusion and integration into benefits and services. So we do that in the areas of public accommodations and government services. Uh, public accommodations would be anywhere where business is conducted. You know, a, a hotel, a restaurant, a movie theater um, has to be accessible to people who experience disabilities. Um, but there are also other kinds like um, telecommunications and transportation and things like that. So all of those things have to have um, accessibility uh, features. Um, their employment is another huge area covered by the ADA and, and you can't discriminate against a person uh, based on, upon their disability. Okay, we've talked a little bit about parking. If somebody has a disability, what does that person do so that he or she can park in one of those spots? Well, in Montana, uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles provides both decals and license plates for um, people who experience disabilities uh, to use um, those uh, designated um, parking spots. And you have to apply for them. Um, the requirements uh, include um, having a disability that's recognized on a list of disabilities and then having that disability certified by a medical professional. So once you do that, you can mail in, I think it's called a DMV-5 is the form. Okay. And you fill out the form and you can mail it in or fax it in or email it. And um, there's of course the registration fee that would be the same as uh, any licensing vehicle fee. Okay. And then the decal is free where you hang it in the mirror. And, um, and then you should be good to go. Okay, perfect. Let's talk a little bit about public transportation. Um, are there certain requirements that public transportation has to meet in order to uh, be accessible to folks? Both public um, transportation vehicles like buses and private companies that provide transportation for the public are subject to the ADA. So they have to have um, sort of information signing requirements. Um, they have to have um, seats that are accessible. They have to have um, uh, ramps or lifts or things that are assistive technology uh, and they have to allow for service animals on buses for instance. Uh, operators have to provide time for people, additional time if it's necessary for them to board. Uh, operators have to be trained. Um, so those are the kind of requirements. Okay, perfect. What about polling places? You know, every American has a right to vote, but if a person has difficulty trying to get to a polling place, what are their options? 
polling is very important and there's a, a separate law dedicated just to voting access for the elderly and people who experience disabilities. But again, the key word for polling places is access. Can the person who experiences a disability get to the parking lot and park in an accessible space, get from their vehicle to the building in an accessible walkway and get into the building? Are, are there stairs that are prohibitive? Is there a ramp? Is there an elevator? Um, those kinds of things would be required. Once they get into the building, is there a clear um, path to the booth, uh, the voting booth and mm -hmm. those kinds of things? So all of those would be required by the ADA. Okay, um, let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about seniors with disabilities. They can sometimes face uh, different barriers that maybe younger folks would. Can you talk a little bit about that and what issues you see with seniors who experience disabilities? It's, it's very common actually for seniors um, to experience disabilities. And what we see often are um, the kinds of issues that would then arise, arise in housing, like needing reasonable accommodations in long-term care facilities and uh, any kind of medical issues or um, those kinds of things. So uh, we often work with seniors in those reasonable accommodations areas. Okay, perfect. We're just about out of time. Any parting thoughts you would want folks at home to know about when it comes to disabilities, advocacy, rights? Uh, just what would you like to close on today? Um, the main thing, I guess, is um, being aware um, that people who experience disabilities are people first and um, they are entitled to opportunities, benefits, services, and um, the key um, to that is to provide accessibility. So accessibility and awareness are key. Perfect, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing all your expertise. And I wanna thank Cassandra for joining us today and sharing her personal experience. We appreciate your time and thank you for tuning in this week. We hope you enjoyed our show and that you'll come back again next week. Until then, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Have a great week. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the YouTube icon. Special thanks to Fire Tower Coffee House and Roasters. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.